Howdy, folks. Welcome to DC. All right. So here we are. So let's, uh, this is Washington. Let's talk politics. And specifically, let's talk Trump. Okay, I know, I know you all are, have been waiting to do that. You're excited to do that. This, this guy is probably the worst candidate nominated by a, you know, a major party in our lifetimes. Um, you think about it. You know, this is a dude with no political experience at all who thinks the way you run for the presidency is by, by going down the list of the great American ethnic groups and insulting them each in turn. Right? He talks... And then, you know, insulting other groups, too, so that everybody gets insulted one way or the other. Some people insulted twice, cross-insulted. And, um, you know, he talks constantly about representing working Americans, but himself comes from the most exalted reaches of the plutocracy. In fact, became famous firing people on TV. Uh, he's profoundly unpopular, hated even by many uh, Americans. The only reason he even has a chance is because the Democratic candidate is hated as well. So think about this, folks. Two of the most unpopular presidential candidates, well, since polling began, running one against the other. Okay? What, what are the chances of that happening? Not just one party nominating a really, really unpopular figure, but both of them doing it simultaneously. And both of these people, of course, right, running entirely negative campaigns. The Democrats saying, vote for us because you can't have this monster in the White House, and you can't, and the Republicans chanting, lock her up, right? You've heard this, right? I mean, what's more, and the, the, the weirdest twist, the families of these two candidates are personal friends, right? Chelsea and Ivanka, Bill and the Donald, right? Everybody hates one or the other of these two candidates, but their, their, their families are pals in private. Now, the contrast, one of these two extremely unpopular candidates was the nearly unanimous choice of her party's uh, machinery, while Trump, of course, went against the Republican hierarchy from the beginning. Hillary, we all know her here in Washington, longtime Washington professional. She knows the way it works. Secretary of State, for Pete's sake, a United States Senator, First Lady all through the 90s. Trump seems to have no fucking clue, isn't even really sure what's in the Constitution and what isn't. Hillary, so, you know, so polished, takes pains never to offend anyone. Trump does nothing but offend. One of them, you know, Hillary knows all about how a political campaign is run, how you reach out to this uh, demographic group and that. You focus on the swing states, you do your micro-targeting, you do your big data, you manage the press, you run your ground game, all of this stuff. Uh, Trump has no idea, no clue, right? He just says whatever comes to mind. It's like the Facebook feed of his brain, you know? It's just like, you know, one thing after another. And he thinks of the election as some, or he seems to think of it as some kind of celebrity showdown with results that'll be determined by everyone calling in, you know, an 800 number, 1 800, make America great again, or whatever it is. Look, folks, by all rights, this should be an enormous blowout, right? A landslide in the making, a 1972 kind of uh, uh, triumph. And yet, at this point, it's still weirdly kind of close. I can't get over the fact that Donald Trump is going to win any state at all, let alone that he, he might win a whole bunch of them. You know, it's bizarre. Now, but this is the weirdest thing of all. The reason he's doing well, the reason that he has a following at all is because, now remember, this is a billionaire who is famous for firing people. He's winning enthusiastic support from the white working class, okay, a demographic group that is watching its way of life fall apart. Now, this is fascinating, right? Because think about these, the people that, that he's appealing to. They were not just once Democrats, but profoundly Democratic, right? The needs and desires of working class people were what made the Democratic Party what it is or what it was, right? Serving working people is why you have a Democratic Party and why, say, Franklin Roosevelt won four terms as president. And now they're lining up with this guy, this billionaire, right? What the hell happened? What the hell is going on in this country? Or flip the question slightly. How is it that so many working class Americans decided to support this character? How did the Democrats succeed in losing the favor of this essential Democratic group? Because folks, what I'm gonna suggest here in the uh, 15 minutes that I've got uh, for my whole social theory, and you're gonna like this, right? That the degree to which the Republicans have won these people over is the same degree to which the Democrats have abandoned them, okay? Let's talk about some of the issues before us, okay? 
think the question again, how is this guy possible? How is Trump possible? Well, think about the sort of overarching question of our time, inequality, right? Um, you know, which has grown so enormously in the course of the last 30 years. Well, think about inequality in the Democrats. Once upon a time, protecting the middle class society was the mission of the Democratic Party. That's what it was about. And you take some of your old school Democrats like Harry Truman or Lyndon Johnson or something, and they would have known exactly what to do about the economic situation that the middle class is facing nowadays. Now, these guys were screwed up and wrong in all sorts of ways, but they were one thing they were really, really, really good at doing was defending uh, the middle class society. But when it comes to taking on this, this enormous challenge of inequality, our modern day Democrats tend to falter. And they acknowledge, as President Obama does, that inequality is rampant and that it's an awful thing, but they can't find the conviction or the imagination to do what is obviously necessary to reverse the situation. And instead, they offer up the same kind of high-minded policy platitudes that they've been dishing out since the 1980s. And you know what I'm talking about. They tell us there's nothing anybody can do about technology or globalization, right? That's the hand of God reaching down into human affairs. And so they promise us, you know, oh yeah, they'll give us more charter schools, more job training, and they'll shovel out the student loans, folks. But other than that, they got nothing. Now I want to get very specific here for a second and talk about what I think is the great issue of our time, of our young century, the financial crisis and the Wall Street bailouts a few years ago. Which, this was the inflection point, right? This was the historical turning point where we as a nation could have gone in a different direction, but we didn't. Why is that? Think about what it was like in those days. President Obama was elected in this massive wave of hope and enthusiasm, and, and I was sort of part of that. You remember the gigantic uh, crowds down in the National Mall when he was inaugurated? And then he proceeded to continue the policies of President Bush as regards Wall Street, essentially unchanged. So none of the big banks got put into receivership. Uh, none of the bailouts got unwound. None of the bankers at the top ever got prosecuted. So Obama and his Democrats refused to change course when every sign was telling them that it was time to turn, when it would have been good policy to turn, when it would have been overwhelmingly popular. I mean, the country had his back at that point, when the country fully expected President Obama to turn. And when I say the country, I mean the Wall Street executives too. They thought they were going to get taken to the woodshed. And lastly, when it was fully within President Obama's power to take this country in a different direction back in 2009, and he chose not to. Now look, we've just come through a great uh, democratic primary in this country where you had this sort of uh, conflict between pragmatism, Hillary Clinton, and idealism, right? Bernie Sanders. But in this case of the Wall Street uh, bailouts, the idealistic thing was also the, you know, getting tough with Wall Street was also the practical thing to do, and the healthy thing, and the popular thing. And our leaders chose not to do it. Now, I know that in the parameters of our dumb system here in Washington, that the Democrats are the good guys, or the, I should say, the less bad guys. But it's not a coincidence that all of the gains of the recovery that we've had since those days, since 09, all the gains of that recovery presided over by a Democratic president have gone to the already wealthy. And this is not, or I should say, not only because, I mean, sinister Republicans have thwarted the righteous liberal will. I know that Republicans are awful. I know all about this. But what we've got here, what I'm talking about here, is a straight up failure of the other side, of the Democrats. President Obama played this issue the way he did, and we have to get our heads around this, folks. He played this issue the way he did because that's how he wanted to play it. And I call that a failure, but you know what the right word for that is. It's a betrayal that I'm talking about here. And this, the history of this goes back a long way. It doesn't start in 2008. When I was um, younger, in the 70s, the Democratic Party uh, used to always be grappling with its identity and fighting over who they were and what they stood for. And it was all through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And you had all of these different factions in the Democratic Party fighting like cats and dogs. But one thing they all agreed on was that Democrats had to turn away from the legacy of the New Deal, the 1930s, with its weird fixation on working class people. They had to give that up. They disagreed on everything else, but they agreed on that. And the man who brought closure to that civil war was, of course, Bill Clinton. In case you aren't old enough, that is the husband of Hillary Clinton. 
And Bill Clinton came to Washington and brought a new kind of democratic administration with him. And this is what we have, this is the period that we have to look to, I think, if we want to understand what is, what is, what the hell is going on around us right now. Okay? The Clinton years. Um, we'll soon be saying the Bill Clinton administration. Because look, so he comes to Washington, and rather than doing what all previous Democrats had done, which is you pay homage to the 1930s and the legacy of Roosevelt, Clinton did the opposite. He did these amazing favors for Roosevelt's enemies, for the banks, for the radio networks, for the power companies, for the bosses, basically. Deregulated Wall Street, uh, ensured that derivative securities would be traded without supervision, deregulated radio and telecoms, and basically put an end to the federal welfare system back in 96. Now, Bill Clinton had a, you might not remember this, but he had this strategy as a candidate you remember the 1992 election. When he was running for president, he would go out of his way to insult or to distance himself from some traditional constituency of his own party, of the Democratic Party, and thus, in this way, assure the public that he was his own man. Uh, the most famous example of this is when he contrived somehow to insult Jesse Jackson to his face while the cameras were rolling, and they called this the sister soldier moment. And there was a logic behind what Clinton was doing to people like Jesse Jackson and others, and the logic was that people like him had nowhere else to go, right? What are they gonna do, go and vote for the Republicans? And he, he kept, Clinton kept doing this once he'd become president. It became a full-blown philosophy of government for this guy you know, going after the people who had just got you elected. The classic example here is the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, uh, and which the Republicans had negotiated, but they couldn't get it through Congress, so it was up to Clinton, right? They couldn't get it through Congress because Congress was controlled by old-style Democrats at the time. Clinton got it done. And when he did, uh, he wasn't just insulting his friends in organized labor who opposed it. Think about this. He was conniving in their ruin. He was assisting in the destruction of their economic power, doing his part to undermine his own party's greatest historical ally, to ensure that forever, in any kind of conflict between management and labor, management always has the atom bomb. They can always threaten to move the plant, right? Uh, and sometimes they even follow through on it. So he made their problems materially worse. It's an interesting point. Now, who were the heroes of this new uh, Democratic Party that Bill Clinton and his friends were building? Well, the same Democratic thinkers that kept advising everyone to abandon workers and abandon the 30s, abandon the New Deal, had the answer. What Democrats had to embrace, they would say, was the emerging post-industrial economy, and the people that Democrats needed to identify with were the winners in this new order, the highly educated professionals who populated our knowledge industries. And by professionals, I mean you know, lawyers, doctors, but also math PhDs who write derivative securities, biochemists who make prescription drugs. All the, this was a group that once upon, in like the Eisenhower years, had been solidly Republican. Today, they're Democrats. And that's who the Democratic Party really is, essentially is uh, these days, a party of the highly educated professional class. The Democrats have other constituencies, as we all know, but professionals are the ones whose needs always come first. These are the people whose outlook always prevails, and it's their tastes and their manners that are celebrated by liberal newspapers, and it's their way of regarding the world that's taken for granted by Democrats as being objectively true. So what I'm saying is that professionals today dominate liberalism in the Democratic Party in the same way that Ivy Leaguers, say, dominate the Obama cabinet. Uh, Democrats have all of these uh, uh, wonderful ways of talking about their favorite demographic, the professional class, all these lovely terms of endearment. Um, they call them, you're going to love this, a, a wired workers who will inherit the future, a learning class that truly understands the power of education. They're supposed to be a, a creative class that naturally rebels against fakeness and conformity. They're supposed to be an innovation class that just can't stop coming up with awesome new stuff. <laughs> and of course, Democratic leaders themselves are always drawn, exclusively drawn from the ranks of this group. Uh, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and Hillary as well. All three of them were plucked from these lives of obscurity by prestigious colleges. And the time that they spent at really fancy schools is what defines them as individuals. Uh, and look at their cabinet choices, at President, the people who advised President Obama, all of these successful professionals whose worth was established by their achievements 
in college and in grad school. Okay, so let's, let's summarize for a second. So Democrats look at the professional class and they see this class of people in a kind of like inverted Marxism. These are the heroes of history. These are the winners of our new economic order. They're the number one constituency of the Democratic Party and all of our Democratic leaders happen to be drawn from the same group. So folks, it's this shift that I'm describing from the traditional working class to professionals that explains so much that is frustrating about our modern day Democrats. Uh, remember the problem of Obama and the banks that I started with. Why did Obama and his team fail to do what needed to be done, what obviously needed to be done with the Wall Street banks, the great issue of our century? Why did they fail? Why did they declare that Wall Street executives were gonna be held to a different legal standard than ordinary criminals? And they did say that. The guy who said it had to resign, but he said it. Welcome to Washington. Why did Team Obama choose Wall Street over average Americans again and again and again and again? Because, folks, for the achievement-conscious people who fill the administration, investment bankers are more than friends. These people are peers. They're classmates. I mean, the two groups are basically the same, and people go back and forth through the revolving door. There's no difference between them. You know, the administration, they look at Wall Street, they see people of subtle minds, this, this sophisticated jargon, and they're, they're total suckers for that. Sophisticated jargon, this extraordinary powers of innovation, right? Exactly the sort of creative individuals that Democratic Party theory tells us we have to honor and respect, right? They're making these financial instruments that are so admirably complex, right? And uh, ditto, of course, ditto for big pharma, Right, so innovative. You can't import generic pharmaceuticals from Canada or India or something, no, 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 no. You have to protect these innovative companies. And mega dittos for Silicon Valley, of course, an industry that can do no wrong in democratic eyes. I mean, so lovable, so professional, so creative that for this one industry, folks, enforcement of our country's antitrust laws has basically been suspended. Right? Bow down before Uber, the company that is rewriting the social contract of our nation. Uh, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, we debate all these different things about Hillary Clinton, but we never talk about what she did as Secretary of State. Uh, she used to go around the world proselytizing for something that she called internet freedom, by which she meant that access to certain Silicon Valley servers, Facebook, Google, whatever, was a basic human right. Okay? That was the foreign policy of your nation, folks. So what does, what does a party of the professional class look like? What does it believe in? Well, the most important item on the list is, of course, meritocracy. The idea that the successful deserve their success and that the people on top are up there because they are the best. Right? And this is the first commandment of the professional class. Everyone gets what they deserve, and what they deserve is defined by how they did in school. Did they get a little gold star? Did they get a 4.0 grade point average? Now this is, you guys know this, is meritocracy is wrong and is full of shit in a hundred different ways. But where it is wrongest, <laughs> and where it is shittiest, <laughs> is as a way of taking on the problem of inequality. I mean, our society is coming apart, and this is a doctrine not for mitigating it, for healing it, but for rationalizing this situation. This is the exact opposite idea. Folks, there is no solidarity in a meritocracy. Uh, the people at the top of our society, of our professional class, the guys in the Treasury Department, the guys on Wall Street, show this amazing, this enormous respect for one another, this deference, but they feel zero sympathy for less fortunate members of their own disciplines, right? If you ever have worked in a white collar workplace, when someone gets fired, uh, his, his friends, you know, they, his co-workers don't rally around him and go on strike or something like that. They always figure he had it coming. Uh, you look at the academic, what's happened to you know, uh, uh, being a, a, an academic in America, a professor, right? Where it's been totally casualized uh, and the, the people who have tenure in this country don't give a damn about it. So I know the story I'm telling you. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you think about it in one way, this story that I'm telling is, hap is happy and inspiring. Think about it, this is the Victorian era all over again. This is the coming together of money and merit, of success and righteousness. This is the marriage of finance 
with political virtue. Because virtue and righteousness are what being a liberal is all about these days. But in another sense, this transformation that I'm describing, this is an unmitigated disaster. Left parties all over the world were founded in order to advance the fortunes of working people. But our left party here in America has chosen over the last 30 years to make, turn its back on those people and make itself instead into the tribune of the enlightened professional class, a creative class that makes innovative things like derivative securities and smartphone apps. And the working people that the Democratic Party used to care about, its leaders figured, had nowhere else to go in the famous expression from the 1990s. Folks, look around you. They found somewhere else to go. By abandoning these people, Democrats have made inevitable both economic desolation of the kind you see all across the Midwest, as well as a populist backlash against liberalism itself that has been building slowly for decades. 12 years ago, I wrote a book about what it looked like in Kansas, the state where I come from. Folks, it's everywhere now. It is all over the country, swarming up out of the, I'm almost there, this is the last sentence, swarming up out of the deindustrialized zones, screaming its bizarre Trumpian slogans. Okay, and so that's our choice, folks. Angry right-wing intolerance, inequality forever. Folks, there's gotta be a better way. Thank you very much.